Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Oh, I don't care what Mama don't allow, gonna draw my modern anyhow. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Welcome to U.S. Modernist Radio, where we talk with people who enjoy, own, create, dream about, preserve, love, and hate modernist architecture, the most exciting and controversial buildings in the world. Show your support by visiting U.S. Modernist's massive mid-century modern archives at usmodernist.org. Today's guest is Eugenia Wu of Historic Seattle. And now, just back from the federal courthouse and an FBI indictment, your hosts, George Smart and Frank King. Yeah. Yes, we cut a deal with Bob Mueller, just like everybody else. You know, he's been trying to get us for a heinous, shocking crime from our youth. Actually, I was in my, as was George, in the... Our young 50s, but that's not important right now. Anyway, here's <laughs> young the joke. 50s. George and I were at a party in 2002. It was late. We were drinking. Big surprise. And George had this old copy of Porky's, which I had never seen. And it's a classic. And one thing led to another. And before we knew it, George had illegally duped the VHS tape to another tape. Bob Mueller and the FBI have been after us for years. For that, we lawyered it up. We delayed. We avoided. We outright lied. But you know Bob Mueller. The guy's like a dog with a bone. He got us anyway. So uh, good news is not going to be serving any jail time. Oh, that's good. We're just sentenced to house arrest and to watch Porky's two over and over and over. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh. And the good news is support for U.S. Modernist Radio comes from Sarah Sonk of Mod Homes Realty. Trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, <laughs> clean, and reverent. <laughs> She's got a merit badge in modernism, and you can reach her at www.modhomesrealty.com or 919-601-7339. Thank you, Frank. Seattle has coffee and rain. Amazon and Microsoft has amazing Tom Kundig houses. It also has our guest today, Eugenia Wu, one of Seattle's top advocates for historic preservation. She is the Director of Preservation Services at Historic Seattle and is a co-founder and board member of Dokomomo Wiwa, which means, and I'll say it slowly, the Documentation and Conservation of the Modern Movement Western Washington Chapter. That's quite an acronym. Founded in 1974, Historic Seattle preserves Seattle's architectural legacy. Eugenia has a BA in Political Science from the University of California, Berkeley, and a Master's of Urban Planning and Preservation from the University of Washington. Welcome, Eugenia. Thank you. Hi, hi, George. How did Seattle get started? I mean, I remember an old TV show called Here Come the Brides, where they were importing women from Connecticut or something. Is that how it really happened, or we were, <laughs> were we misled in the late 60s? <laughs> the historic Seattle or the city of Seattle? The, the city of Seattle. The city of Seattle. I oh, figured no. your organization was not started by brides from Connecticut. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> West Coast cities are much younger than those of the South and the East Coast, but we're not that young. <laughs> As with many cities around the country, of course, there was the first people who were here, uh, the Native Americans, and with the whole manifest destiny and go west, we have a lot of that history, of course. But it's a relatively young city if you compare it to the East Coast. But uh, we definitely have, uh, just because our history isn't as old doesn't mean it's not significant. And, and when we talk about modernism, um, then that has sort of another hurdle in some people's minds in terms of, of what's significant or historic. And so Dokomomo Wiwa and Historic Seattle, uh, we, we work to save historic places of many different eras. So it wasn't loggers who imported brides from Connecticut. That's not the story. <laughs> right. Sorry. Sorry, George. Oh, man. You know, uh, that was like Bobby Sherman and David Soule came up on that show yeah. and became big teenage heartthrobs. That was right around David Cassidy time. This is Here Comes the Brides? Yeah, Here Come the Brides. It it was on like two years. It just came and went. You can IMDB it or whatever you do with (laughs) TV shows. Eugenia, back to the topic at hand. Let's start out with a couple of the projects that you've been involved in. In 2008, I understand there was a building, uh, Manning's Cafeteria slash, I guess it became a Denny's later. Tell us about that building and, and what you encountered. 
Uh, sure. That was um, originally Manning's Cafeteria or Cafe. And the history of Manning's was actually they, um, they made coffee. So it was way before Starbucks. And There was were, something before Starbucks? I did not oh, yeah. know that. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you could drink in, coffee in Seattle before Starbucks. Okay. Yes, yes. And they were located in Pike Place Market or Historic Public Market. Um, Where people throw like, fish. Right. Okay. <laughs> and so this yes. was, I think, since the 1920s. And they actually um, opened up cafes uh, along the West Coast, so it wasn't just in Seattle. And the Mannings in the Ballard neighborhood in Seattle, in the northwest section of town, was this sort of iconic Googie-style diner. And it was, uh, I believe, pretty popular. And then I don't remember when it turned into a Denny's, but um, more recent memory, people remember it as Denny's. And so the building was uh, nominated for Seattle Landmark by the owner, not because the owner wanted it to be a designated landmark, but through our environmental review process, it triggered a landmark nomination for review by the Seattle Landmarks Board. And so I got involved with an advocacy effort with some uh, other local advocates. And uh, I think we ended up calling ourselves the the Manning Six. The Manning Six, wow. That's like political uh, prisoners or something. (laughs) There you go. And (laughs) so we... we, Did you get jailed, Eugene? Did it like save the Manning Six? (laughs) No, we did not. We didn't get that far. Oh, man. But, yeah. yeah. Eugenia, did you say that it was done in the Googie style? Correct. Yeah, tell Uh our listeners about that. What is that? Okay. The Googie style, there's actually a a book on it uh, by Alan Hess. Um, Alan Hess, one of our former guests. Yes. And um, imagine 1950s, 60s, people recognize it in diners and coffee shops. It could be other commercial buildings. And they sort of have these swoopy roofs. and um, a lot Like of, early uh, Shoney's, you might think yeah. of. Right. Like, yeah, every, every region in the country sort of has their sort of version of the Googie-style diner. A lot of glass and ah, okay. see-through. And um, there was very few left in Seattle. It may have been one of the few left that hasn't been had not been altered that much. And so advocates worked to save the building and to to propose uh, not to stop the new construction, which was a proposed apartment building. It was on a large lot. The Mannings was on the corner, not in the middle of the lot. So we proposed the new development could go around the building. So you would still save the building, use it almost as an anchor and restore it. And since mid-century is so popular to have it, you know, be some cool hipster bar or lounge or something and then have the apartment building next to it. Um, But the owner didn't want that. And so the Landmark Sport did designate it as a Seattle landmark and can show that there's economic hardship or no return on investment, then the Landmarks Board can either accept that and not put any controls on it, meaning it anything can be done to the building, can be torn down, or they could have chosen to move ahead with the controls and have the designation continue. And so unfortunately, the economics part didn't work out and the building was demolished. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Oh. I was hoping we had a, a better ending to this story. No, no. So this was the gateway to to the Ballard neighborhood, one of the popular and more historic neighborhoods in the city. And so now you see sort of a nondescript apartment building at this main intersection as you enter the neighborhood. Are there any Mannings left? No, there are not. Um, and well, by the time it was, it became a Denny's. So Mannings, I think, as a business, had closed quite a while Previously. ago. Previously, correct. There are lots of Denny's left. They're not extinct yet. <laughs> <Correct>. <laughs> <laughs> it would take a lot to knock them out. Yeah. So the next building on the list is Warehouser's Corporate Campus in Federal Way. This is quite an impressive facility, not just for the building, but for the landscape design and its groundbreaking open plan concept. Tell us about that building. Sure, the Warehouser, and, and Warehouser is from Minnesota originally, the family, and they moved out west because there was a lot of <laughs> trees out here in, in the northwest, a lot of forests, yeah. <laughs> logging, lumber was a huge industry in the Pacific Back to northwest. here come the brides, they were yeah, logging and they were having to get that wood out on the ships. There you go. 
And so Warehouse and Family established here, and this was their headquarters building in the city of Federal Way, just south of Seattle, off of Interstate 5. And it was the large campus, architecturally significant, designed by Skidmore Owings and Merrill, and a landscape designed by Sasaki. And it was built in the early 70s, around 1970, 71. Uh, very significant for the landscape, the architecture, and the interplay between the two. And it's a large building, but the warehouser sold the property a few years ago. Uh, they, they had been downsizing over the years, and they want to be in Seattle. So they actually built a new headquarters building in Seattle's Pioneer Square neighborhood. And the property sold to a developer, and they're looking to keep the building, which is good, but, but redevelop some of the land nearby. And so that's the concern with what's going to happen to the context of the property, the significance, and because that's it's not just the building and the landscape, but also what surrounds it. There's a bonsai garden and a rhododendron garden that's really important. And I think the proposal has been to put up these massive tilt-up concrete warehouses um, what is a tilt-up warehouse? It's just um, concrete walls that are kind of big box retail, you know, maybe like a Costco or name your suburban big box store. Walmart, Target? A lot of those are like tilt-up construction because they're okay. easy to put up. Doesn't the tilt-up mean almost that the uh, the walls and such were prefabricated and they just sort of, they tilt them up and put them in place as opposed to build it from the ground up? Like an Amish barn raising? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> If the Amish had concrete, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so these are not necessarily custom designed for the site or the location. It could be anywhere, and they are purely functional. And so, there's actually a group in Federal Way called Save Warehouser, and they are actually leading the advocacy effort, trying to convince the city of Federal Way not to issue the permits for the warehouses and to try to find a better use for the site. How many acres is it? Uh, I don't remember. I don't know. It sounds like it would be fairly large, I would guess. Yes, yes. I mean, there's still a lot of trees there, and I think one of the arguments that the developer makes is, oh, with the tree line where it is, and you won't really see the warehouses, but it, it's unclear. Oh, 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 yeah. Yeah, the invisible yeah, right. warehouses. Exactly. So, Eugenia, let me play devil's advocate for a second. So, if I'm the developer, and I'm just trying to do what I do, and I promise to save a significant building, why can't y'all leave me alone for the rest of it? Uh, in preservation... It's not a black or white thing. It's that there's a lot of there are a lot of gray areas, and our approach to historic preservation advocacy is we try to find a win-win. So it's not don't redevelop that site. It's let's redevelop it in a more compatible way so that it fits the site that is on in terms of the use and also the design, and have some respect for the historic building and landscape and the context. So it's not don't build there, but Let's let's look at some alternatives to what we can do. I mean, that sounds very good in, in theory, but I mean, what's the practical application? Do you half bury these warehouses and make them a little shorter or something? I mean, how do you how do you compromise on something like that? Well, I think you start from what they're proposing. I mean, that can be anywhere. And also, you know, doing due diligence when, when a developer purchases a property, he needs to look at what, what's there, what's around there, and what developer probably shouldn't be buying historic buildings or potentially historic buildings knowing full well that there could be some issues down the road. And so to try to be more sensitive to, to the neighbors and, you know, you got to kind of start from somewhere. So is this a situation where there'll be a designation effort again for the property like in the previous example with Mannings? Well, the city of Federal Way currently does not have its own landmarks ordinance or preservation ordinance and, and a historic register and landmarks commission. So local designation is not an option. And local designation is where protection comes for a historic property because it's based on an ordinance, which is law. And for national register listing, because it is private property, that is only allowed with owner consent. So for public property, publicly owned properties, 
can be listed on the National Register without owner consent. So in this case, uh, it has been determined a warehouse or a campus has been determined eligible for listing on the National Register by the State Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation, uh, but without the owner's consent, it can't be listed. If it were listed, it would be eligible for federal historic tax credits, but whether those are going to be around is sort of up in the air given what's right. been going on with the tax bill. So that's sort of that. So the usual path of historic preservation of listing of property is not uh, an option at this point. And National Register listing in and of itself is honorary. It does not provide protection for a property. No, it, it doesn't have any special magic powers. No. So Manning's gone. Warehouser's still there. Still working on that. Let's go to our third project. At the University of Washington, they had a nuclear reactor building that you've been involved in that's gone through quite a bit of of controversy and back and forth. Tell us how that building came onto your radar and and your journey through trying to protect it. Sure. Around the time that I was working on advocacy for the Mannings building, we started working on advocacy for the nuclear reactor building. And when I say we, preservation is sort of most uh, effective when we collaborate. And so Dokomomo Wiwa, Historic Seattle, and the Washington Trust for Historic Preservation, which is Washington State's nonprofit statewide preservation organization, we were contacted by a, a master's of architecture student who was on campus, and she found out that the nuclear reactor building was going to be demolished. And so she connected with all three organizations to see what can be done to help save it. And the nuclear reactor building was built in 1961, and it was a research reactor and built at a time during the atomic age when nuclear energy was definitely more new and being researched and taken seriously as a source of potential energy. And it was unique because most research reactors around on different campuses across the country were pretty much underground and not really seen. This one... Uh, Yeah, for good reason, I guess. Right. This one (laughs) kind of sort of celebrated the era and the architecture, and it was designed by a group called the Architect Artists Group, or TAG. And it was Wendell Lovett, who was an architect, Dan Streisguth was an architect, Gene Zima, architect, um, structural engineer, Gerard Torrance, and artist Spencer Mosley. So this was actually a collaboration of art, science, and architecture. And uh, Was it recognized at the time as being aesthetically pleasing? You know, at, at the time, I think it depends probably on who you talk to. I mean, definitely it was um, appreciated. I've talked to I've talked to people who were students at the campus at the time, and up until it was torn down, they said it was it was this little gem. It was one of my favorite buildings on campus, and and because it it was so different from everything else, the University of Washington campus initially was the site of the 1909 Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition. And uh, only four buildings are left from that period. As as you know, World's Fair buildings usually aren't built to be permanent. And so subsequently, many of the buildings designed there on the campus were more Gothic revival style. So this one stood out for its sort of size and its and its style and its use, obviously. Are, are you aware of any other... I mean, just the notion of a utilitarian-type building. Are there any other nuclear reactor buildings that are considered to be shining examples of modernist architecture in the world? That's a big question. I I wouldn't say I'm an expert on it, so in the world. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I know in the research, it is it was listed on the National Register of okay. Historic Places. And, uh, and at a time when it was, um, before it was 50 years old. So it met the exceptional significance criterion for the National Register. And it was clearly recognized as significant. The difference is the first floor was just all glass, so a window. So you could actually kind of peek through and look look through and see kind of what's going on and see oh, the researchers wow. working. And at night, it kind of glowed. And it had oh, boy. Plaza in the front, so it's sort of connected to the hard. You want your nuclear building to glow? That has got to be a <laughs> <you> requirement. <laughs> well, well, maybe yeah. it, it's a built-in advantage. <laughs> 
Yeah, glowing from the lights, not from right. uh, other things. But ultimately, the nuclear engineering program, I believe, was, was closed at the university. And then the building was decommissioned, and you know, I think in the 80s. And there was a whole pro- federal process to do that, as you can imagine. So by, the, by 2008, it had been vacant for years, and, but it just sort of stood there kind of... Um, as this reminder of an earlier era, but also we looked at the adaptive reuse potential for it. And again, you know, with a, a campus with a lot of in-house sort of creative people who can probably think about design and potential uses, and we were hoping to, again, get a win-win on this. But So at the time, it was proposed for demolition. We all kind of galvanized for this effort to try to save it and The student who initially contacted us did her master's thesis on the adaptive reuse of the building. There were t-shirts made, students got involved, all these things. It was listed on the most endangered list by the Washington Trust, and we were trying to basically save the building. And ultimately, the recession hit, and that kind of saved the building for a while because the university didn't have the funding to build anything to replace it. But we knew it would come back, and in 2014, we were informed that uh, they wanted to demolish the building and replace it with a second new computer science and engineering building. And uh, there was one built 10 years prior just across the street that triggered environmental impact statement, which was an opportunity for public comment, and which we participated in. But we knew that ultimately the university, they've always stated that they were not subject to the Seattle Landmarks Ordinance because they are an institution of higher learning, a state institution of higher learning. So they were... Ah, So they pulled the, we are not subject to this exemption. Exactly. However, the University of Washington is still has to get building permits, demolition permits, and so... Of course not, because yeah, they want to cherry pick now. Exactly. Right. And the university has been a good steward of their buildings. It's a beautiful campus, it's the Olmstead Brothers design, and we just wanted to see the post-World War II buildings treated with some sort of respect. Eugenia, and, hang on just a moment. We have breaking news. Uh, to answer your question, Tom, another nuclear reactor building <laughs> built in the modernist style yeah. is here in Raleigh, North Carolina. The NC State what? Nuclear Building was designed by our own beloved Milton Small Holy cow. in the late no, 50s. The guy designed my house. Yeah. <laughs> oh my so, yes, there's at least oh, one wow. more, Eugenia. Wow. wow. So we're back to the, to the university saying that they're not subject to these rules. Right. And that's how it's been. And so we were thinking, well, what can advocates do? We were figuring, okay, if that if this is how it goes, then the building's going to come down no matter what. And we knew that the environmental impact statement process is something that they legally have to do. They were their own lead agency. And we knew that even though they, they had to come up with a preservation alternative, because in environmental impact statements, you need to come up with alternatives to to the project, we knew that uh, what they were proposing, any adaptive reuse, they basically engulfed the new building around the nuclear reactor building, and that just was not really preservation friendly. And we knew ultimately they wanted it demolished. And so we knew that we had the Seattle Landmarks Ordinance track, which we could challenge basically because in the city of Seattle, uh, anyone can submit a, submit a landmark nomination and owner consent is not required well, for whether it's for p- private or public property. And also using the media. And so we those are the two routes that we, we chose. So in December of 2015, Doko Momowiwa submitted a landmark nomination for the nuclear reactor building. And within a couple of weeks, the University of Washington filed a lawsuit against the city of Seattle and Doko Momowiwa, which, by the way, is an all-volunteer nonprofit organization. Ah, so, and, you, you, so obviously it was easy to lawyer up. <laughs> yeah, correct. Not. I spent I spent uh, my Christmas vacation looking for an attorney for the organization. Right. Did so you find one? We found a good one. Yeah, he's great. And so that started this process that's been a couple years long now. And the King County Superior Court, which is the trial court level here, on April first, that that's when the oral arguments were presented. Um, April Fool's this, Day. 
Yes, we thought the assistant city attorney did a fantastic job. We were more in a, our attorney did a more support role because the city did a really great job in their in their case and their arguments. We thought we presented a better case. Unfortunately, uh, the trial court judge did not agree, and she only ruled on one issue and completely ignored the substantive issues. And she bought the university's argument that the Lamar's ordinance, the way they define, it defines owner, that the university does not fit within any definition of owner, uh, which is an individual, a group, an association, or a corporation. And they said, well, we're none of those things, so therefore we are not an owner, according to the Lamar's ordinance. And we thought, well, there's no way that argument will fly. Well, that's what she based it on, and then she didn't. She she said, well, it's not. They're not an owner according to the ordinance, and then she didn't bother to rule on anything else. So the university won. Within a couple months, they got their demolition permit, and they demolished the building in the summer of 2016. Hmm. So and sorry. We thought, well, what if we try to seek a stay on the demolition? Because if we appeal the decision, then we figured, okay, maybe the building will stay until it goes through the court system. But unfortunately, once the trial court judge ruled that was the law, and then if we wanted to place a stay on it, then we were told by our attorney that most likely we'd have to post a bond, which means putting up collateral, which means property that our three organizations, or two of them own, Docomobo doesn't own any property, and that just financially would have not been a good path for our organizations, because if we were to lose on appeal, then the university, if they wanted to, they could come after us for damages. So that was not a path that we ended up taking, and so the building got The building's gone. Uh, But we did appeal the city and our three organizations to the State Court of Appeals, and that State Court of Appeals decided they actually asked the State Supreme Court to take the case, and the State Supreme Court took it, and so it skipped the Court of Appeals altogether and went directly to the State Supreme Court. And and what happened? Earlier this year in June, oral arguments were presented, and in July of this year, the State Supreme Court gave a unanimous decision, 9-0 in our favor and the city's favor and our favor. Oh, and, and so what does that mean, given that the, the building is gone? What does that really mean? So what it really means is really moving forward. What the Supreme Court ruled that the University of Washington is subject to the Landmarks Preservation Ordinance. This means that for future buildings and or landscapes or the whole campus would be subject to landmark designation and review. You know, we lost the battle, but we won the war kind of thing. Yeah. And, and also, state Supreme Court said that all state agencies must comply with local development regulations adopted per the Growth Management Act. Eugenia, you've been talking to us about commercial industrial type buildings. Have your organizations, either Docomomo, Wewa, or Historic Seattle, gotten into trying to preserve or save modernist houses in the Seattle area? We own eight historic properties, and one of them is actually a single-family house built in the 1950s, and that was we saved because it was actually on Seattle Parks and Rec land, and it's a sort of funny area of the city, it's kind of between neighborhoods, and they didn't want the property anymore, so we actually purchased it from them. Um, and what was significant about this house? Well, the design, the style, the architect who designed it, uh, it's, a, it's a very unique. Who was the architect? Uh, Robert Reichert. Robert Reichert, okay. Um, yeah, and so uh, we, we rented out as a single-family home, and it's sort of a unique property in our portfolio. So that was one time where we, we saved a house. So we do raise awareness and bring appreciation to modern design, and a lot of Docomomo's tours are actually house tours. We don't just do house tours, but we those are the ones that kind of really bring people in because we all like to see private homes and yeah, we wouldn't know anything about that. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I guess I don't stay up at night wondering how they decorated the nuclear reactor. You know, <laughs> what sort of carpet. Now, Eugenia, you said you rent this house out. Does that mean like you, you rent it a year at a time or can we like Airbnb it with you? Uh, no. So we have a tenant and, and uh, he lives there. Uh, but no, it is not an Airbnb. <laughs> oh, okay. 
Well, that's too bad. I was thinking there's an opportunity for one of our listeners to go out to Seattle. Yeah. Get a sweet little house for a month or two. Yeah, there, I, there are probably others, though, around that are uh, someone can stay in. In terms of the advocacy, we, we do get a lot of calls about houses. And a lot of them are maybe in other areas just outside of the city of Seattle. But some of those are in cities or in unincorporated King County where there's no actual landmarks ordinance. So, again, we kind of come into that problem of what sort of existing preservation laws are, are there to protect a single-family home. And many of them are view properties or they're on a lake, and so they're very desirable, basically land. So if someone purchases it, they really don't care about the house. They'll, they'll get torn down and replaced by something, something new. In your organization's work, just say in Seattle, I'm wondering if you have some of the same phenomenon that we have here where a developer wants to buy a building that's significant and do something with it. And in what they think is a brilliant gesture says, well, we'll we'll tear it down, but we'll keep like the front part of it and we'll sort of platter that on to the new building. Does that happen there? Oh, yes. Facadism, yes. Facadism. Oh, it has a term. Yeah. Okay. So I actually wrote up an entire article on this issue for Arcade Magazine, which is a local journal of Northwest architecture. And there, that's happening quite a bit here, more than we'd like, particularly in two neighborhoods. One is South Lake Union, where Amazon's located, and a lot of the high-tech companies, and also in the Pike Pine area of Capitol Hill, which was historically sort of the auto row of Seattle. And you have a lot of former auto garage buildings or or auto showroom buildings, like one to two stories that have been used for many different uses because they're highly adaptable. And because of the proximity to downtown, and it's a hip neighborhood now, if that's where people want to live, and it's one of the denser neighborhoods in Seattle, then what we're getting is a lot of these facades and projects where zoning allows for maybe up to 65 feet high, and but these buildings are more like one or two stories. And so if you keep the main facades, then you get an extra story. So you can build up to 75 feet. So there's actually a what's called a Pike Pine conservation overlay, and that's the incentive that gives developers extra height if they saved the oh, facade. Yeah. But, but, but this doesn't really do anything, does it? I mean, it just sort of splatters up the bit of the old building on the new structure. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so they go through all this trouble just to, it's, well, if you look at my article, you'll see some photographs of what happens when essentially it's a demolition of the building and you just have, you know, maybe some brick pilasters left or some walls, and but the windows are gone or they kind of put new ones in and, and then they put a new contemporary building up there. So you're not getting real historic preservation and you're getting a kind of an odd new design. And so I personally, in Historic Seattle and Darko Momo, we support good new design. I mean, if things were better designed, then I think a lot of people wouldn't have as many issues, but we're not getting sort of the best built buildings in the city. So this is sort of like quitting my job, but still walking by the office every day and saying I work there. (laughs) (laughs) Or showing up in the company cafeteria to have a cup of coffee. Yeah. (laughs) Even though you don't Like, yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Yeah. Eugenia, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate your being part of the program and keep doing all the great work out there in Seattle. Well, thank you, Frank and George. I appreciate it. And Tom, and um, really appreciate you asking me to participate. And I think it's great what you do. And um, go modern. Well, and before we go, guys, I want you to know that the nuclear reactor we spoke of in Raleigh was dubbed by the Associated Press as the first temple of the atom. Oh, wow. It was the first non first non-federally owned nuclear reactor. How about that? Wow. Everybody's doing research today. (laughs) We are our own research department. All right. Thanks for listening. U.S. Modernist Radio is underwritten by Sarah Sonk, your real estate angel for modernist houses. 919-601-7339. Okay, Tom, take us out. Visit usmodernist.org for more information about today's guest. U.S. Modernist Radio is produced by Soundtracks Recording Studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. 
Our theme song was performed by George Smart and Robinson Earl. Cindy Stratton and the rest of us researches stuff in her pajamas from her secret underground bunker. <laughs> U.S. Modernist Radio is a production of North Carolina Modernist Houses, a nonprofit educational archive for the documentation, preservation, and promotion of modernist residential design. I'm Tom Guild. Remember, it's not hard to find a good modernist architect. The real problem is finding a good modernist builder. Amen. George and Frank and I will be back in two weeks with another edition of U.S. Modernist Radio. Mm-hmm.